5.7, apply the fundamental theorem of algebra. I've got no comment for this one. So you must be thinking to yourself, how have I made it this far in life without knowing what the fundamental theorem of algebra was? And I hate to disappoint you, but it's really, really straightforward and simple. If f of x is a polynomial of degree n, where n is greater than 0, then the equation f of x equals 0 has at least one root in the set of complex numbers. And remember, a root is just a zero. So it's saying that we have at least one solution to f of x equals zero. And don't let um, the set of complex numbers scare you because remember our complex plane had the real numbers over here and it had the imaginaries over here. And so if we had something like this plotted right here, that would just be Five, and that would be a real number and we could have something that was purely imaginary like if it was plotted right here that would just be 7i so this is purely imaginary and then we could also have a complex number that was like this right here which would be 2 plus 3i which had a real part and an imaginary part so that's really all this is saying and it was first proven by Gauss as you've been seeing or hearing me point out in the examples in the last couple of sections, we were seeing that the number of zeros was equal to the degree of the equation. So for example, if I have x cubed plus 3x squared plus 16x plus 48, the degree, the highest degree I see is 3 here. And so that would mean that I have three solutions. In this example, when I have x to the fourth, this degree, the highest power I see, is four. So that means that I have four zeros. And let me tell you why I said solutions here and zeros here. I said solutions because this one, I said it equal to zero. So I said it had three solutions. But this one, I didn't do anything with it. So I could say that if I said it equal to zero, then I would have had four solutions. So. That's why I changed the terminology there. The main point I'm trying to make here is just that the degree of the equation is how many zeros you have. Now the one side note that I need to put on this is that repeated solutions are counted a repeated number of times. What do I mean by that? Say we had some equation, f of x equals x cubed minus 5x squared minus 8x plus 48. And I told you that could be factored into x plus 3 times x minus 4 squared. Well, the zeros, they would just be negative 3 and 4. But I just told you that this should have three solutions since it was cubic. The thing is, is that this is just repeated once, but this one is repeated twice. And so even though I only have two distinct solutions, I have three total solutions. This one just has multiplicity too. And we're going to talk more about that, but I just wanted to make that as a side note. So if I had something like x minus 4, the quantity cubed equals 0. You know that if I multiplied this out, it would be a cubic equation, so I should have three solutions. But I only get one answer here. That just means it has multiplicity 3. Okay, so that's just a side note. We'll talk more about that later. Now, in this next example, how many solutions does the equation have? Oops, if I was saying solutions, I should have said it equal to 0 on both of these. So I could have also reworded that question, how many zeros, and then I wouldn't have had to put that. And so this one, since the degree is 4, I have 4 solutions. And here, since my degree is 3, I have 3 solutions. Just make sure that on all of these that you're making sure that they're all in standard form. In other words, that the degree is descending. So in this problem here, it's not asking me how many zeros I have, it's asking me to actually find them. And so I'm going to use my calculator to help me in this one. So get your calculator. 
And so in y equals, I'm just going to put that equation, x to the fifth power minus 4x cubed plus x squared minus 4. And then I'm going to graph it. And you'll see here that it looks like my zeros are like negative 2, negative 1, and 2. But you'll notice that that's only three things, and I should have five answers. So I'm going to need to check this out. But before I move on, I just want to make sure that those are all actually zeros. So I'm just going to check them out, check out the values. When I put in negative 1, yep, that's a zero. When I put in negative 2, yep. That's a zero. And then second calc, let's just try positive two. Yay, that's also a zero. So let's go back here. And we just found out on our calculator that the zeros were x equals negative two, negative one, and two. So we didn't see any other ones. So that means, therefore, there must be two imaginary solutions since we don't see them. So how do we find the imaginary ones? We go ahead and divide f of x by each of our real zeros. And I would use synthetic division. So here we have fifth, oh, we have zero fourth, so don't forget your placeholders, fourth, third, squared, and then none of the x's, and then constant. So please don't forget your placeholders. This is fifth, fourth, third, squared, x, and constant. So let's just use negative one as the first of our zeros. So bring down the one, you get one, multiply, add them up, multiply, add them up, multiply, add them up, multiply, add them up, multiply, add them up. And so you should get zero as a remainder, of course, because we knew negative one was one of the zeros. And so now I'm not going to even write anything out. I'm just going to go ahead and divide by my next zero, which let's just use two. And I forgot about the negative two, so I'll do that one last. One, multiply, add them up. One, multiply, add them up. Negative one, multiply, add them up. Multiply, add them up. And we don't use this because that was just a remainder, so I'm not using that anymore. It's not part of my factored solution anymore. Just like this is now no longer part of my factored solution. That's just my remainder. So when I go and divide by my final zero, which was the negative two, I'm not going to use that part because remember, it's just my remainder. And if I wrote out the factor, it would have just been this part here. And so I get one negative 2, negative 1, multiply 2, add them up, 1, negative 2, add them up, and I get 0. And again, the remainder should always be 0. If they're not, you did something wrong because we had just found that these were our zeros. And so this is now my final solution part. And so that would be, let's see, constant x, x squared. That would mean that I have 1x squared minus 1x plus one equals zero is my final solution part. And I obviously know I can't factor this down, otherwise it would have been a nice zero. So I'm going to just use the quadratic formula right off the bat. Negative b plus or minus the square root of b squared minus four a c all over two a. And so I get one plus or minus root negative three all over two. And root negative three is just I root 3. And so those are my two remaining zeros. So my final answer would be my zeros are x equals negative 2, negative 1, 2, 1 plus I root 3, 
over 2 and 1 minus i root 3 over 2. And now I see that I have all five solutions. Two more key terms. The complex conjugate theorem says that if we have some polynomial and if a plus bi is one of the imaginary zeros, then we must also have a minus bi be a zero. So that means if they tell me that 5 plus 8i is a solution, that automatically means that 5 minus 8i is also a solution. And so the key is here that your imaginary solutions always come in pairs. The same thing goes with irrational solutions. So if we have a plus root b as one of our zeros, then a minus root b is also a zero. Again, if they told us 5 plus root 7 was a solution, that would imply that 5 minus root 7 was also one of our solutions. So they always come in pairs when you have imaginaries or irrational solutions. Now, let's write a polynomial function of least degree that has rational coefficients, a leading coefficient of 1, and then our zeros are 2 and negative 2 minus 5i. Well, from what I just said, since these come in pairs, that means that another zero must also be negative 2 plus 5i. And again, that's just because they must come in pairs. That's how I like to think about it. And so, Let's see what we have. We have our function, and our leading coefficient's one, so let's just put the one out here. One of our zeros is two. So if x equals two is a zero, then what is our factor? Our factor is just x minus two, so that's one of our factors. If x equals negative 2 minus 5i is a 0, then we would have x minus negative 2 minus 5i as one of our factors. All right, so I'm just going to leave it like that and put it in. So x minus negative 2 minus 5i, and then this one would just be x minus that guy negative 2 plus 5i. In the next step, I'm just going to distribute out this negative sign. x plus 2 plus 5i, and then x plus 2 minus 5i. And so now the next thing I see is I'm just going to group the real part versus the i part because you'll see that this and this is identical, and this and this is identical. So when I go and FOIL, the outer and the inner is so nicely going to cross out for me. And that's always going to happen. And that's why you don't have any I's in your final answer. So I'm going to let this x minus 2 hang out, and I'm going to FOIL this part. So the first is x plus 2 times x plus 2. So I'm just going to write x plus 2 squared. The outer and the inner are the same thing with opposite signs, so they're going to cancel out. And then the last is just minus 25i squared. And so I'm just going to let this x minus 2 still hang out. And I'm going to FOIL the x plus 2. So x plus 2 times x plus 2 is just x squared plus outer and inner is 4x plus 4. x squared plus 4x plus 4. And then remember, i squared is negative 1, and so this is just plus 25. And so I get x minus 2 times x squared plus 4x plus 29. And now I'm going to first distribute the x to each of these. And so I get x cubed plus 4x squared plus 29x plus, and then I'm going to distribute the negative 2 to each of them. So I actually get minus 2x squared minus 8x minus 58. And so that leaves me with x cubed, and then the squares, I have plus 2x squared, 
and then I have plus 21x minus 58. And so that is my final answer. Only real zeros appear as the x-intercept, which is what we just saw back here, that only our real zeros appeared on our calculator as the x-intercepts. The graph only touches the x-axis at the even-powered zeros, and the graph crosses the x-axis at the odd-powered zeros. So that's really important. That means if I have something like x plus 2, the quantity squared, my zero is negative 2 and my graph would only touch there, and that's what my graph would look like, okay? So this is an example of just touching, versus if I have something like x plus 2 times x plus 5, well, I know my zeros are 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, negative 5, and negative 2, and so they would cross there. And that's because these are to the first power or odd. And I knew that both of these opened up because they had positive powers outside of there. And also don't forget that complex zeros come in conjugate pairs. The same thing with the irrational ones. Finally, find the rational zeros. So this would be 1. And this one actually just touches there. This would be negative 2, and that crosses the axis. And this one, well, let's see what's going on there. I'm suspecting it might be imaginary, but I better just check the discriminant. So b squared is negative 2 squared minus 4ac, and that is 4 minus 12, or negative 8. So since that is less than 0, it is imaginary. And this was just asking me for the rational zeros, so they are just at 1 and at negative 2. Finally, let's go ahead and approximate the real zeros of this equation on our calculator. So go ahead to your calculator again. And now on this one, go to y equals and clear out the other one. 4x to the fifth minus 12x to the fourth minus x, minus 3. Oh, and I actually meant this should be a plus, so let's just change that in our calculator right here. Plus 12x to the fourth. Otherwise, it doesn't come out nicely. Okay, and it looks like I have three real solutions there. And it looks like the first one's going to be a nice easy one at negative 3, so let's test that out. Okay, so negative 3 is one of our zeros, but this one I can't tell. So the only way to find this one is going to be using the second calc button and using the zero. So again, I'm going to go as close to the point as I can using just the left and right arrows. That's really close. Then you hit the left arrow once and you press enter. Then again, go to the point. When it says right bound, press the right arrow once, press enter. And then guess is just go as close to the point as possible, press enter again. And so that's our zero, negative 0 0.707. So write that down. And then let's go and find the other one in the same way. So second calc, zero. Go over to the point. Okay, looks like it's about there. So left bound, press the left arrow once, press enter. Right bound, go to close to the point, press the right arrow once, press enter. And then guess is just right in the middle. Press enter. And so our other zero is 0 0.707. Okay. So that's just a coincidence that one of them's negative and one of them is positive like that. And so my zeros, and I only got three of them on my calculator, were three negative point seven zero seven and zero point seven zero seven. And that's it. And that's it for this lesson. Bye.